This tutorial looks at how to manage the symptomatic patient with chronic hyponatremia who are at risk for iatrogenic complications. I'm going to discuss central pontine myelinolysis, otherwise known as osmotic demyelination syndrome, how to prevent it happening and how to diagnose it. I guarantee you'll learn something. Hyponatremia, part four. Welcome back. In the previous tutorial, I discussed the syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion, otherwise known as the syndrome of inappropriate antidiuresis. This is uniformly associated with surgery and critical illness, and it's also commonly associated with community-acquired pneumonia, drugs, and cancers. It's characterized by a low plasma sodium and hypervolemia. I also discussed cerebral salt wasting, a similar disease that complicates subarachnoid hemorrhage, and this is characterized by a low plasma sodium and hypovolemia. In this tutorial, I will discuss the rates of correction of plasma sodium, overcorrection and what to do, and the osmotic demyelination syndrome. Let's start with a couple of clinical scenarios. You are called to the operating room. There is a first year anesthesia resident in that room, and he has administered five liters of 0.45% saline. That's hypotonic saline solution to a patient who is undergoing head and neck surgery. Once the mistake was uncovered, a blood gas was performed. On the ABG, the sodium was 121 millimoles per liter. The patient is under general anesthesia, so what do you do? Well, this is quite easy. In the situation of acute water overload, the treatment is furosemide or other loop diuretics, that's Lasix. You just need to diurese off the liquid and not be too worried about alternative consequences. Next door, the patient is undergoing urology surgery. He's a 74 year old male who's undergoing a transurethral resection of the prostate gland and there's a junior urology resident doing the case. After 1.5 hours of surgery, during which the patient has had spinal anesthesia and some light sedation, the patient suddenly grunts and has a seizure. A blood gas is performed, revealing a sodium of 118 millimoles per liter. What's going on and what do you do? The diagnosis is TURP syndrome and what happens is that water containing glycine is used to flood the surgical space so that the resectoscope has a clean view of the prostate gland and the field that it's operating on. So essentially this water is infused into the area and it washes away the big chunks of prostate. If a surgeon is very inexperienced they don't do a great job of closing off the venous sinuses. So a huge amount of water is absorbed through the venous sinuses and intravasated. This always happens during the operation, but it is particularly bothersome if the surgeon is inexperienced and the operation goes on for a long time. The treatment for this is hypertonic saline and furosemide. You will recall when we're looking at patients with moderate asymptomatic hyponatremia, that's a sodium of in and around 120 millimoles per liter, it's important to look at the patient's volume status. If the patient is hypervolemic, you're going to fluid restrict or diuresis. If they're euvolemic, you fluid limit and give sodium tablets. And if the patient is hypovolemic, you resuscitate this patient with an appropriate resuscitation fluid like isotonic saline, plasmolite, or sodium lactate solution. That's Hartman's or Ringer's lactate solution. Sometimes patients who have low sodium coming into the hospital, they're asymptomatic, and you give them saline and nothing much happens, they just don't respond and their sodium stays fairly low. In this case, it's often caused by long-acting agents that have natriuretic effects. For example, ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers, thiazide diuretics, etc. And the thing to do here is just be patient with the patient. Once the drugs have stopped, just wait a day or two and the sodium will progressively rise on its own once those drugs have gone. And then you can resolve the situation by looking at what the patient actually needs in terms of their therapeutic goals for their hypertension, congestive heart failure, etc. 
For the remainder of this tutorial, I'm going to focus on relatively high risk patients in whom extreme care must be taken to prevent iatrogenic complications. I'm going to toe the party line in that what follows represents the majority opinion of doctors in nephrology, endocrinology and critical care. I'm going to avoid controversies, which I will discuss in a different forum. Now let's go and visit a patient in the emergency room. Richard is 44 years old and he's come into the emergency room following a seizure. On blood gas analysis, his measured sodium is 112 millimoles per litre. You administer 150 mils of 3% saline. In Richard's background, he has a history of chronic alcohol abuse. There are multiple previous admissions to hospital. He likely has cirrhosis and esophageal varices, so this is unlikely to be an acute problem. When we look at hyponatremia at a very early stage while the workup is ongoing, we need to determine whether this is an acute process where there are minimal risks of iatrogenic complications, such as the ones that I've previously described. These are patients who get too much hypotonic fluid, TUR syndrome, or else just drank a lot of water because they were feeling sick, for example, and they are really at very, very low risk. Then we need to look at the patients who are very high risk, and they are the patients who have had hyponatremia for a significant period of time, and they're relatively high risk. And I'll show you how to stratify the risk a little bit later on. But here's the thing, you are called to see Richard on the medical ward seven days after his original admission. At this stage, remember, he came in with a sodium of 112 with no osmol gap, got three treatments of hypertonic saline. 16 hours after admission, his plasma sodium was 128 millimoles per litre. That is 16 above where he started. Six days later, his sodium is 145 millimoles per litre. He developed dysarthria and dysphagia yesterday. Today, he has a flaccid quadriparesis. What is the diagnosis? The diagnosis here is barn door. This is pontine myelinolysis, otherwise known as osmotic demyelination syndrome. Pontine myelinolysis, usually called central pontine myelinolysis, I'll explain why in a minute, is a slow onset neurological injury of the pons and extra pontine structures associated with myelin damage. It's a demyelinating disease. Patients characteristically have dysartery and dysphagia and dizziness, often loss of balance and tremor. Eventually, they may become quadriplegic and become apparently comatose or locked in. It typically affects the center of the pons, but it can also affect extra pontine structures. And we do know that the pons is exquisitively sensitive to osmotic shifts in certain situations. The majority of cases of osmotic demyelination syndrome or central pontine myelinolysis is believed to result from rapid overcorrection of dysnatremias, either from very low sodium to normal or from very high sodium to normal at a very rapid rate. This is the classic and irrefutable picture of central pontine myelinolysis on MRI. This is the flare axial sequence and you can see that the center of the pons is lighting up. This is diagnostic of demyelination. On the sagittal image, you can see that this is also present. And on the T1 weighted images, you can see that this typically affects the central pons. Since originally described, osmotic demyelination syndrome has been shown to impact extra pontine structures as well. And that's why they coined that particular term. Now I have issues with that term because calling it osmotic demyelination syndrome suggests cause and effect. And a radiologist may mention that potential diagnosis in the report, but that diagnosis does not necessarily mean that it was osmotically driven by correcting hyponatremia. Over several decades, a series of risk factors have been identified that indicate a patient is at high risk for osmotic demyelination syndrome. These include chronic hyponatremia, 
A very low plasma sodium, particularly if it's below 105 millimoles per liter, indeed below 110 millimoles per liter, is considered high risk. Alcoholism or liver disease, malnutrition, a urinary sodium of less than 30 millimoles per liter, a low plasma potassium, and rapid correction of abnormal, usually low plasma sodium. To prevent the development of osmotic demyelination syndrome, believed in the majority of cases to be caused by rapid overcorrection of sodium, a number of consensus guidelines have been developed by experts, not necessarily based on high quality evidence, mind. Generally, all guidelines regarding the treatment of chronic hyponatremia with a sodium of less than 120 millimoles per liter suggest one of the following. Limiting the rise in plasma sodium to less than 8 millimoles per liter in the first 24 hours and to less than 10 millimoles per liter in the subsequent 24 hours, or limiting the rise in the sodium to less than 18 millimoles per liter in 48 hours. The former guideline is typically the European guideline, the latter is the American guideline. In our practice, we follow the European guideline, limiting to less than 8 in the first 24, less than 10 in the subsequent 24 hours. The primary intervention in the management of symptomatic chronic hyponatremia is to administer hypertonic saline in sufficient quantity to increase the plasma sodium by five millimoles per liter. Once that has been achieved, one can fluid restrict the patient, investigate blood and urine and assess the risk. It's essential to remember that an osmol is an osmol. And if you're giving potassium replacement to your patient for hypokalemia, for example, potassium chloride or potassium phosphate, those particles all count towards plasma osmolality. Also, the administration of potassium in and of itself increases plasma sodium by pumping sodium out of cells and potassium into cells. So if the patient is requiring potassium, we consider them to be very high risk and the quantity of hypertonic saline delivered must be decreased. If the patient is getting, for example, 20 millimoles of KCL, then reduce the hypertonic saline dose by 40 mL. So instead of 150, you give them 110. If the patient's getting 40 millimoles of KCL, then reduce the hypertonic saline by 80 mL and then in that situation, they get a 70 mil bolus. In terms of risk assessment, we are looking for several factors. A very low sodium, less than 110 in particular, alcohol abuse, malnutrition, liver disease, and a low plasma potassium. In these cases, you need to really consider modification of your sodium correction strategy the correction rate probably should be six millimoles over the first 24 hours and eight millimoles over subsequent time spans. And if you look back at Richard, who got a standard dose of hypertonic saline, he corrected 17 millimoles within the first day. This is spectacularly poor clinical practice. If the patient doesn't have these risk factors and they're still at some degree of risk, then the sodium correction should be a maximum of eight millimoles over the first 24 hours and 10 millimoles subsequently. Sometimes overcorrection and overshooting takes place. The most common cause of overshoot is the sudden elimination of a large volume of dilute urine or acroresis. This can result in an increase in the plasma sodium by more than two millimoles per liter per hour. So you must measure the plasma sodium and the urinary output carefully. If the plasma sodium increases by more than eight millimoles per liter in the first 24 hours, you need to look at the initial sodium and risk profile. If the sodium started at greater than 120 millimoles per liter, there is really no great risk to the patient unless the rise is fairly dramatic, for example, over a couple of hours. If the sodium is less than 120 without simultaneous risk factors, then the patient is at low risk for iatrogenic complications, so you can tolerate a rise of up to 12 millimoles per liter 
with that intervention. But you need to be careful if it's rising rapidly. If there are risk factors with a sodium of less than 120 or the sodium is rising rapidly, then this is a high risk situation and you need to stop and reverse the sodium rise. How do you do this? First, you need to stop all IV saline or isotonic fluid. Secondly, you need to look at the urinary output. If the urinary output is lower than 100 mils per hour, then start a dextrose infusion and match urinary output. You may also need to replete losses. If the urinary output is greater than 100 mils per hour, you need to apply a desmopressin or DDAVP clamp. You administer 2 micrograms of DDAVP and that will stop urinary output in its tracks. You shouldn't give it more than every 8 hours. So to summarize this, if overcorrection occurs, give dextrose and match urinary output. This prevents further rise. You may give additional dextrose to lower plasma sodium and if the urinary output is more than 100 mils per hour, it is advisable to give DDAVP. But you need to be extremely careful as you have now taken away the patient's ability to control their own fluid balance. You need to be doing hourly sodiums, usually in a blood gas machine. You also need to go full on Miss Trunchbull. Now, this is Miss Trunchbull from Matilda, the movie. You need to get rid of any source of water or liquid that the patient might decide to swig down. Otherwise, there is a risk of rebound hypotonic hyponatremia. So now let's put all of this together. You're called to the high dependency unit to see Liz, who is 54 years old. Liz presented to hospital with a headache and a plasma sodium of 111 millimoles per litre. She has a known history of alcohol abuse. She was admitted to the HDU and issued with fluid restriction orders, but she has just had a seizure. How are you going to manage her? So let's work the problem. So Liz, sodium 111. What is the first thing that you're going to do? Your answer might be, for example, you will administer 150 mils of 3% saline, in which case I would say, is there any other information that you need first? The answer is, we need to know what our plasma potassium is. Her plasma potassium is 2.8 millimoles per litre, and she has 40 millimoles of KCL in 100 mils running. So what are you going to do now with your hypertonic saline? You're going to reduce the dose of hypertonic saline to 70 mils. What's your goal? The goal here is resolution of symptoms and a rise in the plasma sodium by 5 millimoles per litre. The seizure and headache stops. Her sodium is now 113 millimoles per litre. What are you going to do? In this situation, the sodium has only risen by 2 millimoles per litre from the dose of hypertonic saline that we gave her. So I think at this stage it's reasonable to repeat hypertonic saline. You have to make a decision about the dose you're going to give her. For example, you might decide to give her 150 mils as per the standard guideline, or you might just give 100 mils or just the rest of the 150 as if she had been given that. That would have been 80 mils. What is the maximum sodium rise in the first 24 hours? In this setting, Liz is very high risk. So I would suggest 6 millimoles per litre in 24 hours and 8 millimoles per litre subsequently. Her sodium is 119 millimoles per litre after 18 hours. What info do you need? Well, you want to know what her urinary output is. Her urinary output is 120 mils per hour. Well, what are you going to do? In this situation, we need to start a 5% glucose infusion to match output, but we're also going to give her DDAVP because her sodium is going up that bit too fast and she's a higher risk patient. Four hours later, though, 
Her sodium is still 120 millimoles per liter and her urinary output is down to 80 mils per hour. What are you going to do? This stage, you're going to discontinue the glucose infusion and withhold DDAVP. At 36 hours, her sodium is 118 millimoles per liter. What do you think? Well, this is clearly under correction. This is well below the level that we would have anticipated, which was six millimoles per liter in the first day and then eight millimoles per liter subsequently. That would have been 14 above where we were a goal of 125 millimoles per liter. And in this situation, it is worthwhile giving this patient hypertonic saline 3%, about a mil per kilogram with a maximum of 150. Now you may need to adjust this because you need to dynamically change by looking at her urinary output continuously and her sodium continuously. But that's a generalized guideline about how to approach it. Now let's review this tutorial. In this tutorial, we determined the utility of correction of hyponatremia. And we looked at patients who became acutely hyponatremic. We didn't get terribly excited about it. We gave the patients diuretics and potentially some hypertonic saline. I then talked about moderate hyponatremia and fluid status and what you do. And again, it's not a medical emergency. It can be managed gently on the ward. I then talked about risk stratification of patients with clinically significant hyponatremia of lower than 120 millimoles per liter and the risk of osmotic demyelination syndrome, otherwise known as central pontine myelinolysis. I looked at the risk versus the rate of correction, what to do when the targets are reached and what to do when the patient overcorrects and what to do when the patient undercorrects. That's the end of these tutorials on hyponatremia. Next time we're going to move on to discuss hypernatremia. We're going to talk about hyperosmolality and the treatment of hypernatremia. Join me then and I guarantee you'll learn something. That's the end of this tutorial series on hyponatremia, where I looked at the management of the patient with chronic symptomatic hyponatremia and the prevention of the development of osmotic demyelination. I will add on a couple of opinion pieces to this, but the next tutorial in this particular series is on hypernatremia. Join me then and I guarantee you'll learn something.